I look to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This quote right here is from the infamous I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King Jr. This is probably, in my own opinion, the most overused quote used to seem holier than thou. This quote also is used to glorify almost Martin Luther King Jr. as a justified black messiah figure. This makes it very easy for revisionist historians to portray Mr. King as an upright, moral, next to sinless person. And if you dare say contrary to Mr. King being an upright or moral, then one is either deemed a racist, coon, or they themselves are just pure evil. Because of revisionist historians, when people come across quotes from Joseph H. Jackson or Christian evangelist uh, Solomon Lightfoot Mashal, a man who strongly opposed Martin Luther King Jr. and his movement, people cannot wrap their heads around how a man can oppose the oh-so-righteous Dr. King. And perhaps he was an informant to the wicked FBI who just hated black people. By the way, yes, Mr. Mashal was an informant for the FBI. Howbeit, how come people cannot objectively see the reason why certain people, especially in the Christian community, may oppose Mr. King Jr.? This is why I started with the quote from the I Have a Dream speech. Because I believe it is only right to judge Martin Luther King Jr. by the content of his character and not by what the media portrays him as or what he has been portrayed as for generations. Let me present you with some facts and let us judge righteously the truth about Mr. King. This presentation will go over the truth behind the so-called civil rights movement and one of the main heads, Martin Luther King Jr. Some of the things that will be stated in this presentation will be deemed, quote-unquote, controversial to those who already have it in their hearts that the civil rights movement was the greatest thing ever and that Martin Luther King Jr. was the second coming of Jesus. I am well aware that the masses have already been convinced and brainwashed of that and whatever I present in this presentation will be ignored and will cause many people to emotionally rage despite the facts presented. However, I will carry on for the truth. For the truth is important and if I can convince at least one person after this series is finished, then it will be worth helping set someone free with the truth. In Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 5, Christ states to his disciples while sitting on the Mount of Olives, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. For those who believe in the scriptures, and for those who do not, of course, the Bible warns us about false prophets. Unfortunately, Many people believe these false prophets who proclaim to be a Christian and never test the spirits to see if they truly are a follower of Christ or not. Let us observe Martin Luther King's Christian journey. The first piece of evidence I would like to present is the birth certificate. Lo and behold, the man that we all call Martin Luther King Jr. actual birth name is Michael. In the birth certificate, you can clearly see that Michael is crossed out. The reason why his name was changed from Michael to Martin is because of his father, who also changed his own name from Michael to Martin. The story behind this, according to his father, Michael Luther King Sr.'s autobiography, is that he had a revelation after traveling to Jerusalem and going to Berlin, Germany, the world uh, for the World Baptist Alliance in 1934. While in Germany, he did visit where Martin Luther, the reformer, posted his 95 Thesis. This was also reflected in the final transformation of his name from Michael King to adding Luther to finally Martin Luther King, as well as changing his son's names likewise. We can look at this in two ways. The first way we can see this is that he respected Martin Luther so much that he wanted to honor him by changing his name despite it being a form of idolatry. 
The second way could be that Michael was his and his son's slave name and Martin Luther was his spirit animal. However, you can decide on that. Growing up, Martin Luther King Jr. grew up in a Christian household with his father being a minister at Ebenezer Baptist Church. His father used to preach a social justice gospel or better known as the Black Liberation Theology. I've deemed this very important to present this fact because here is where we will see how Martin Luther King Jr.'s philosophy began to form. The way we are raised influence our mindset. Or, according to Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, the 6th verse, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. But let's discuss what is black liberation theology. Black liberation theology is a cancer that has vexed Christianity as well as many societies into their downfalls. Unfortunately, many people are ignorant and have been deceived into what and where black liberation theology came from. Black liberation theology is an offshoot of Marxist liberation theology that was rampant and devoured South America. If anyone who knows history, it should raise serious concerns that a certain theology is closely associated with the ideals of Marxism. And for those who do not understand the seriousness and the terror this ideology has done, it will be behoove of you on what Marxist leaders such as Stalin, Mao Zedong, Che Guevara, and Fidel Castro done to their ruling nations. I guarantee that once you see what the ideology called Marxism has done to beautiful nations, then I hope you'll understand why I stated you should raise concerns. Another name I call this theology is the social justice gospel. Black or black Christian liberation theology puts a focus on liberation from social injustices in the world. However, we must turn to the Bible in John the 18th chapter, verses 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. Do not think that I'm saying that we should not focus on the evils in this world, but the Bible clearly tells us that this world is ran and rampant with wickedness. And when we follow Christ and enter into his kingdom, we have an understanding that his kingdom is heavenly and righteous. However, we must wait until he returns for we are sealed unto the day of redemption. However, liberation theology, like the root of many false Christian doctrines, focuses on a heaven on earth and not for the hope of Christ returning to save us from an eternal hellfiery judgment. Of course, we should strive for righteousness everywhere, but it is just unrealistic since men are fallen by nature. This world is filled with sin and by nature, we tend to rebel against the Most High and His laws. In Romans, the third chapter, verses 23, it states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Christ died for our sins, so we may be blessed with eternal life. The failure of black liberation theology is that they rarely talk about sin and the need for Christ. They tend to care much more about the issues of racism and encourages envy and animosity specifically towards a certain enemy. Commonly, the enemy not being the devil per se, but the rich and the quote-unquote white devil. But this view contradicts biblical doctrine for the law of the Lord tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verses 7 that thou shall not abhor an Edomite for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. The sad and inconvenient truth of the black liberation theology encourages black pride. Even though the Bible tells us that pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall, according to Proverbs 16, chapter, verses 18, if we understand this, then we can understand why there is so much chaos and self-proclaimed 
Christians that contribute not much Bible nor righteousness when it concerns the so-called black community. Christ came to unite all with him, being the head and the believers, the body. I personally do not give a hoot about the color of your skin, for I nor anyone but the Most High has control of how you were born. Most of these issues of race, especially in our modern secular culture, is filled with vanity. And because many in the black churches are preaching and teaching a social justice gospel, it is no marvel why the so-called black community is the way it is. Mr. Michael King Jr. planted seeds across black America of the social justice black liberation theology. And the seeds of the so-called black liberation theology has brought forth corruptible fruit. He did not teach the gospel. He taught a different doctrine. He told the world that he was a Christian but when we analyze his beliefs with the Bible, as we will later on in this presentation, it is clear that he is a liar. Lastly, according to the word of God, who is the father of all lies? Though Martin Luther King Jr.'s father was a quote-unquote Christian preacher, just like many who latch on black liberation theology, he was an activist. And just a side note, the root word for activism is act. Therefore, what? These people who call themselves activists tend to be actors whether they know it or they don't. Some of the things Martin Luther King Sr. did a part of his activism were riding the white-only city hall elevator, also being a local leader of organizations such as Atlantic Civic and Political League and the NAACP, and we already know what they're about. In one instance, King Sr. held a rally at Ebenezer Baptist Church that had more than a thousand activists participating. He referred to his own past and urged black folks towards greater militancy. He suggested to block off a road as an act of protest and stated in his speech, I ain't gonna plow no more mules, he shouted. I'll never step off the road again to let white folks pass. I do find it very funny that a so-called Christian preacher is encouraging hatred between races and militancy, which is contrary to the Christian doctrine. We see similar acts of protest during the civil rights movement shedding light to the fact that Martin Luther King Jr. was not the originator to these methods, as well as how much he was most likely influenced by his father and not uh, Mahatma Gandhi. However, According to King, he did grow up in a loving and stable household. When it comes to Martin Luther King Jr.'s Christian salvation testimony, King states in the paper title, An Autobiography of Religious Development, that he joined the church at the age of five at a revival following his sister not wanting to get ahead of him and not because he understood the concept of salvation. I mean, look, and there's no disrespect for those who said that they were saved at the age of five or six. But what five-year-old understands the concept of anything, let alone Christian salvation? He states in the paper, From this, it seems quite clear that I joined the church, not out of any dynamic conviction, but out of a childhood desire to keep up with my sister. And here, he proves my point, that his salvation and conversion at that age was not genuine. Church was a second home for Martin Luther King Jr. growing up, but it was at Sunday school around the age of 12 where he started to question the Bible. At the age of 13, I shocked my Sunday school class by denying the bodily resurrection of Jesus. From the age of 13, no doubts began to spring forth unrelentingly. At the age of 15, I entered college and more and more could I see a gap between what I learned in Sunday school and what I was learning in college. This conflict continued until I studied a course in the Bible in which I came to see that behind the legends and myths of the book were many profound truths which one could not escape. In my humble opinion, I do find it normal that around this age is where children would start to question the Bible. But I will say that his minister father 
and his church failed at proving that the word of God is true. However, I am not surprised because of the evidence of his father, the pastor, preaching a black liberation theology. That means what? He had no foundation in the true word of God. It is no wonder why his son at this age did not believe in the word of God. But he's a very, very young man at this time, and there is still room for change. So let us analyze his college papers and the speech to see if he did change his views. It will only be fair. Martin Luther King Jr. went to college at the age of 15, and even then, he denied many parts of the Bible. When he went to Crozer Theological Seminary in 1951, he still denied many parts of the Word of God. The paper we will observe is called The Humanity and Divinity of Jesus, which will be in the link below if you want to follow. He wrote this paper as his thesis while attending Crozer Theological Seminary. Here's where we will see that Martin Luther King Jr. denies the Godhood of Jesus Christ as well as see that the black liberation theology trumps the word of God and his own world view. I do want to put in the frame the requirements of a pastor according to the Bible for it is very important to know what the Bible considers a pastor, a bishop, a minister of God. In 1 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 2 through 9 and 14 through 16, it states, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, and of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own home, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. These things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So we see that a pastor, by his fundamental basis, must believe that God was manifested in the flesh and resurrected that and that one is saved through Christ and Christ alone. So let us begin and bear with me because this may be long and boring. However, it is very important to read, especially since many people worship this man named Martin Luther King Jr. or his actual birth name, his God-given name, Michael King II. Many years ago, a young Jewish leader asked his followers a question which was all but astounding. He had been working with them quite assiduously. During their work together, he was constantly asking them what his contemporaries were saying about him. But one day, he pressed the question closer to home. It is all very well to say what other people think of me, but what do you think of me? Who do you say that I am? This question has gone echoing down the centuries ever since the young Jewish prophet sounded its first note. Many have attempted to answer this question by attributing total divinity to Jesus with little concern for his humanity. Others have attempted to answer this question by saying that Jesus was a mere good man with no divine dimensions. Still, 
Others have attempted to get at the question by seeing Jesus as fully human and fully divine. This question, which was a prominent in the thinking of the early Christian centuries, was not answered once and for all at the Council of Chalcedon. Rather, it lurks forth in modern theological thinking with an amazing degree of freshness. I, so one of the many miseducated points that has been taught to the masses, not just to Mr. King, but to the masses, is that the Catholic Church was the first church and that the other denominations came out of the Catholic Church system. All we have to do is look in the Bible and you will see that out of all the churches that the Apostle Paul wrote to, that the way the Catholic Church system is ran is nowhere near how the Bible tells us how to run and conduct church. The Council of Chalcedon, or however you pronounce it, was a Catholic council, and they tend to have a very bad habit of changing the Word of God and creating rules for the believers, even if it contradicts scriptures. In the book of Revelations, it already tells us that if you add or take away from scriptures, let them be a curse. And due to church history being revised, many Christians have believed this lie. You can tell already that Mr. King believes that the Catholic Church was the first church, regardless of the churches we see in scriptures such as Ephesus, Corinth, etc., in grappling with the questions of the person of Christ, modern Christians thinking is unanimous in setting forth the fully humanity of Jesus, yet Christians have not been willing to stop there. Despite all the human limitations of Jesus, most Christian thinkers have been convinced that God was in Christ. To be sure, Christian thinkers are often in conflict over the question of how and when Jesus became divine. But as to the presence of the divine dimensions within him, we find little disagreement in Christian circles. At this point, we may turn to a detailed discussion of the humanity and divinity of Jesus. Let's stop right here. Well, check this out. It doesn't matter what one thinks or what whatever counsel one brings up. Christians believe by faith. And if the scriptures tells you that God was in Jesus the Christ, then it does not matter what we think. Philippians, the third chapter, verses 14, it states, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So again, scripture makes it clear. But let's skip down to uh, the section titled The Divinity of Jesus, since he really doesn't make no disagreements about the humanity of Jesus. After establishing the full humanity of Jesus, we still find an element in his life which transcends the human. To see Jesus as a mere good man, like all other prophets, is by no means sufficient to explain him. Moreover, the historical setting in which he grew up, the psychological mood and temper of the age and of the house of Israel, the economic and social predicament of Jesus' family. All these are important, is it? But these in themselves fail to answer one significant question. Why does he differ from all others in the same setting? Any explanation of Jesus in terms of psychology, economics, religion, and the like must inevitably explain his contemporaries as well. These may tell us why Jesus was a particular kind of Jew, but not why some other Jews were not Jesus. Jesus was brought up in the same conditions as other Jews, inherited the same trait that they inherited, and yet he was Jesus and the others were not. This uniqueness in the spiritual life of Jesus has led Christians to see him not only as a human being, but as a human being surrounded with divinity. Prior to all other facts about Jesus stands the spiritual assurance that he is divine. As Dr. Brown succinctly states in a recent book, that God was in Christ, is the very heart of the Christian faith. In this divine human person, the ever-recurring anatomy of the universe is presented in a living symbol. 
the antinomy of the internal and the temporal, of the infinite and the finite, of the divine and the human. As stated above, the conflict that Christians often have over the question of Jesus' divinity is not over the validity of the fact of his divinity, but over the question of how and when he became divine. The more orthodox Christians have seen his divinity as an inherent quality metaphysical bestowed. Jesus, they have told us, is the pre-existent Logos. He is the Word made flesh. He is the second person of the Trinity. He is the very God of very God, of the one with a substance with the Father, who for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate, be the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary. Certainly, this view of the divinity of Christ presents many modern minds with insuperable difficulties. Most of us are not willing to see the union of the human and divine in a metaphysical incarnation. Yet amid all of our difficulty with the pre-existent idea and the view of supernatural generations, we must come to some view of the divinity of Jesus. In order to remain in the orbit of the Christian religion, we must have Christology. As Dr. Bailey has reminded us, we cannot have a good theology without a Christology. Where then can we in the liberal tradition find the divine dimension in Jesus? Check this out again. Many false teachers do believe in the humanity of God, but can never wrap their head around the fact that Christ is God, regardless of what man tries to tell us. And frankly, many believers still have a hard time truly understanding the Godhead, including myself. However, the thoughts of the Most Highs are higher than mine and yours. I personally encountered so-called preachers and reverends who doubt the divinity of Jesus and pick and choose what is fact and what is fiction from the Bible. Another thing to notice, so far have you seen Mr. Reverend King Jr. quote from the Bible to prove his point? Have you seen him quote from the Bible at all, despite this being his thesis for seminary college? I hope that, let, let, let that sink in. Concerning the last sentence where we stopped at, like I stated earlier, at a very young age, Martin Luther King Jr. was not taught full-on fundamental Christianity because we see that his father was preaching and actively practicing black liberation theology, which contradicts fundamental Christianity. And for those who read the scriptures, if we do a word study on traditions, then we will know that it is usually not viewed in a good light for godly worship. This is what happens when one tries to mix other philosophies, especially Marxists, uh, with Christianity. What happens is that we will end up serving two philosophies or two masters. In scriptures, uh, Luke uh, 16, chapter, verses 13 no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And in this case, Martin Luther King Jr. holds to the liberal tradition as so far proven in this presentation and does not hold to the true word of God. Let's keep going. We may find the divinity of Christ not in his substantial unity with God, but in his filial consciousness and in his unique dependence upon God. It was his feeling of absolute dependence on God, as Schism maker would say, that made him divine. Yes, it was the warmness of his devotion to God and the intimacy of his trust in God that accounts for his being the supreme revelation of God. All of this reveals to us that one man has at last realized his true divine calling, that of becoming a true son of man by becoming a true son of God. It is the achievement of a man who has, as nearly as we can tell, completely opened his life to the influence of the divine spirit. The Orthodox attempt to explain the divinity of Jesus in terms of an inherent metaphysical substance within him seems to me quite inadequate. 
to say that the Christ whose example of living we are bid to follow is divine in an ontological sense is actually harmful and detrimental. To invest this, invest this Christ with such supernatural quality makes the rejoinder, oh, well, he had a better chance for that kind of life than we can possibly have. In other words, one could easily use this as a means to hide behind, behind his failures so that the orthodox view of the divinity of Christ is in my mind quite readily denied. The true significance of the divinity of Christ lies in the fact that his achievement is prophetic and permissory for every other true son of man who is willing to submit his will to the will and spirit of God. Christ was to be only the prototype of one among many brothers. The appearance of such a person, more divine and more human than any other, and understanding and standing in closest unity at once with God and man, is the most significant and hopeful event in human history. This divine quality, or this unity with God, was not something thrust upon Jesus from above, but it was a definite achievement through the process of moral struggle and self abnegation. <sighs> the whole point of Jesus, who is God, coming down and living lower than the angels and with us humans was because us humans will never, ever, ever live a sinless life. Even if you run away to the mountains of Alishan, we will still sin. Only God can live a sinless life and not break the law. If we read Philippians, the second chapter, verses 5 to 8, we understand that Jesus Christ manifested himself in human flesh to experience the pain, the sufferings, temptations that us humans go through in our human experience. Yet he still managed to sin not. Why is that? The Bible tells us the reason. It's because Christ was God, not just a mere good man. He was fully God and fully human in accordance to the Bible, which Martin Luther King Jr., again, I will keep saying, does not read. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. The Bible was not good enough for Mr. Christian Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He outright denies the divinity of Christ in this paper. You cannot call yourself a Christian, let alone a Christian preacher, if you do not even believe that Christ is God manifested in the flesh. In other essays that Martin Luther King Jr. authored, he even denies that scripture is not quote unquote science. He admits without reserve that he does not believe in the doctrine of the Godhead atonement and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The common reasoning he gives is that the Bible does not agree with his other gospel or his other master. And what I mean by this is that for Martin Luther King Jr., like I keep saying, the gospel of Christ does not fit with the gospel of social justice, liberalism, leftism, and progressivism. We will read excerpts from some papers, and I will leave the source for you in the link below so you can read the rest of the paper for yourself. Um, in this paper, it is titled, What Experiences of Christians Living in the Early Christian Century Led to the Christian Doctrine of the Divine Sonship of Jesus, the Virgin Birth, and the Bodily Resurrection? He specifically touches on the deity of Christ, the Virgin Birth, and the Resurrection. In this paper, you will see more and possibly clearer examples of his denial of the simplicity of the Bible. But if we dwell into the deeper meaning of these doctrines and somehow strip them of their literal interpretations, we will find that they are based on a profound foundation. Although we may be able to argue with all degree of logic 
that these doctrines are historically and philosophically unattainable, yet we can never undermine the foundation on which they are based. Uh, for those who don't know what unattainable means, um, it means that cannot be held, defended, or maintained. So in other words, the divinity of and the resurrection and the virgin birth are undefendable based on the historical facts according, and let me stress that out, according to Michael King II. The first doctrine of our discussion, which deals with the divine sonship of Jesus, went through a great process of development. It seems quite evident that the early followers of Jesus in Palestine were all well aware of his genuine humanity. Even the synoptic Gospels pictures Jesus as a victim of human experiences, such human experiences as growth, learning, prayer, and defeat are not all uncommon in the life of Jesus. How, how then did this doctrine of divine sonship come into being? Okay, that's blasphemy right there. Um, he says that Jesus uh, witnessed defeat. That's far from the truth. Far from the truth. Let's keep reading. We may find a partial clue to the actual rise of this doctrine in the spreading of Christianity into the Greco-Roman world. I need not to elaborate on the facts that the Greeks were very philosophical-minded people. Though, through philosophical thinking, the Greeks came to the point of subordinating, distrusting, and even minimizing anything physical. Anything that possessed flesh was always undermined in Greek thought. And so, in order to receive inspiration from Jesus, the Greeks had to apothecize him. As Hedley laconically states, The church had found God in Jesus. And so it called Jesus the Christ, and later under the influence of Greek thought forms, the only begotten Son of God. Yo, man, it's as if this man did not even attempt to read the Bible. In the Old Testament, we see that the prophecy of Jesus Christ was being told. In the New Testament, when Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman, by the well, she mentions in uh, Matthew, the fourth chapter, verses uh, 25. Uh, let me just pull it up. I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. So the Greeks did not even come up with this doctrine. What is he talking about? The coming of Christ was something known within the Jews and seemingly in the Sumerian culture as well. The more I keep going through his papers about Christianity, it is becoming very, very clear that this man, who calls himself a reverend, does not even study the word of God. He could quote all the philosophers, all the quote-unquote experts and scholars, more than he even does scriptures. And frankly, he has not even quoted uh, one verse from the Bible yet from the papers that we have uh, observed. Let's keep going. First, we must admit that the evidence of the tenability of this doctrine is too shallow to convince any objective thinker. Hmm. To begin with, the earliest written documents in the New Testament make no mention of the virgin birth. Moreover, the Gospel of Mark the most primitive and authentic of the four gives not the slightest suggestions of the virgin birth. The effort to justify this doctrine on the grounds that it was predicted by the prophet Isaiah is immediately eliminated. For all New Testament scholars agree that the word virgin is not found in the Hebrew original, but only in the Greek text, which is mistranslated of the Hebrew word for a young woman. How then did this doctrine arise? A clue to this inquiry may be found in a sentence from St. Justin's First Apology. Lord, Here Justin states that the birth of Jesus is quite similar to the birth of the sons of Zeus. It was believed in Greek thought that an extraordinary person could only be explained by saying that he had a father who was more than human. It is probable that this Greek idea influenced Christian thought. A more adequate explanation for the rise of this doctrine is found in the experiences which the early Christians had with Jesus. 
The people saw within Jesus such a uniqueness of quality and spirit that to explain him in terms of ordinary background was to them quite inadequate. For his early followers, this spiritual uniqueness could only be, uh, only be accounted for in terms of biological uniqueness. They were not unscientific in their approach because they had no knowledge of the scientific. They could only express themselves in terms of the pre-scientific thought patterns of their day. Science. They believe in science. Let me break this down. First, he is stating that if one is a fundamental Christian, that we are not quote-unquote intelligent and quote-unquote, not objective enough to understand the truth. Second, the Gospel of Mark starts off with Jesus' uh, baptism. So, of course, it's not going to start off with the virgin birth, like you see in Matthew and Luke. It seems he is arguing that since Mark doesn't mention the story of Jesus' birth, then it must mean that the birth didn't happen. In that logic, that is utterly stupid, because it does not even disprove anything. Third, the New Testament was not originally written in Hebrew. It was originally written in Greek. Furthermore, in Hebrew, it does mention the word virgin plenty of times. And the term virgin in Hebrew is uh, Bethuela. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, so forgive me. Correct me if you want. Uh, every time this term is used uh, and is mentioned in the Old Testament, it is talking about a pure, unspotted, young virgin. So honestly, Martin Luther King Jr. is trying to sound smart, but is making statements that are very easily disprovable. Uh, concerning the virgin birth, the word incarnate means to clothe with flesh, to embody in flesh. The phrase begotten, son of God, means procreated, generated. This term in Greek is monogenes which means pertaining to being the only one of its kind within a specific relationship, meaning that my only begotten son is not my stepson, that he came by my seed. Abraham's only begotten son was Isaac. For example, in Hebrew, the 11th chapter, verses 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. With this same concept presented to us in scriptures and reality, in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9, it reads, In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Jesus shared the same divine nature of the Most High. In contrast to those who believe in Christ, for the Bible-believing uh, Christians, we are children of the Most High through adoption. The Bible proves my point in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Fourthly, the point I made earlier in the section that he quotes philosophers more than the Bible continues to reign true. Most of the false doctrine that came from the Greeks in the early church was started by a group called the Gnostics. The Gnostics mixed other philosophies such as Aristotle and Socrates with biblical doctrine. They even made new gospels, i.e. the Gospel of Thomas, which was written after the book of Revelations was finished. During this time, you had Christians who abided by the Christian doctrine of the apostles, and then you had Gnostics who influenced Orthodox Christianity and deceived many to get away from biblical Christianity and put more of a focus on being more quote-unquote spiritual, which is usually a cute buzzword for being more pagan. And to briefly touch on the virgin birth being compared to Zeus and that virgin birth story, the difference is that the story of Zeus, as well as Horus, Tammuz, which the Bible uh, makes mention of, are derived from the Babylonian and Kemetic mystery religions, which was a perversion of what was going to happen and how Christ was going to come. I will give off topic very easily, diving into this topic, and that 
is pretty much a uh, topic for a different time. Lastly, he states that the Bible is unscientific. If one reads the Bible and actually studies the Bible, you will see that the Bible has never been proven wrong unless you choose to believe in other theories that are indoctrinated to the masses. The Bible tells us how the world works, how animal works, uh, and this was before all the fancy terms and science came in. I'm not saying that I don't believe in science, but I'm saying that the Bible is science. For example, in Ecclesiastes, uh, the first chapter, verse 7, the book in the Old Testament, may I add, tells us, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. Here's an example of how the river goes into the sea, the clouds soak it up, and brings it back into the river according to the circle of life, dare I say, science. The last doctrine in our discussion deals with the resurrection story. This doctrine, upon which the Easter faith rests, symbolizes the ultimate Christian conviction that Christ conquered death. From a literary, historical, and philosophical point of view, this doctrine raises many questions. In fact, the external evidence for the authenticity of this doctrine is found wanting. But here again, the external evidence is not the most important thing, for it in itself fails to tell us precisely the thing we must most want to know. What experiences of the early Christian leads to the formulation of the doctrine? The root of our inquiry is found in the fact that the early Christians had lived with Jesus. They had been captivated by the magnetic power of his personality. This basic experience led to the faith that he could never die. And so in the pre-scientific thought pattern of the first century, this inner faith took outward form. This is what I mean that the Bible is not good enough evidence for Martin Luther King Jr. The gospel gives us so much evidence what Jesus did and said. King is making a conscious choice not to believe that Christ actually resurrected. The authors of scriptures made it crystal clear that Christ ascended into heaven. And if you choose not to believe in that, then you are not a follower of Christ, plain and simple. It is that plain and simple, and throughout this paper, Martin Luther King Jr. has tried to argue and deny the virgin birth, the deity of Christ, and the resurrection. In this paper, the sources of fundamentalism and liberalism considered historically and psychologically, here we observe that the so-called Reverend Michael King II calls the Garden of Eden story a myth. He continues, like in other papers we analyze, to scold fundamental Bible believers. Let's read. The use of the critical method in approach to the Bible is to the fundamentalist downright heresy. He sees the Bible as the infallible word of God, from the dotting of an I to the crossing of a T. He finds it to be a unity and a coherence of parts. The New Testament is in the Old contained, and the Old Testament is in the New explained. Upon the first proposition, the infallibility of the Bible, all other fundamentalist views depend. They argue that if the Bible is true, that is, so divinely inspired as to be free from error, then all other truths follow inevitability, because they are based upon what the Bible actually says in language clear and unmistakable. When the fundamentalist comes to the nature of man, he finds all his answers in the Bible, as you should. The story of man in the Garden of Eden gives a conclusive answer. Man was created by a direct act of God. Moreover, he was created in the image of God, as we were. But through the workings of the devil, man was led into disobedience. Then began all human ills, hardship and labor, the agony of childbirth, hatred, sorrow, suffering, and death. 
The fundamentalist is quite aware of the fact that scholars regard the Garden of Eden and the serpent Satan and the Hell of Fire as myth analogs to those found in other Oriental religions. He knows also that his belief are the center of ridicule by many, we know. But this does not shake his faith. Rather, it convinces him more of the existence of the devil. The critic says the fundamentalists would never indulge in such skeptical thinking if the devil hadn't influenced them. The fundamentalist is convinced that this skepticism of scholar and cheap humor of the laity can by no means prevent the revelation of God. Other doctrines, such as a supernatural plan of salvation, the Trinity, the substitutory theory of the atonement, and the second coming of Christ, are all quite prominent in fundamentalist thinking. Such are the views of the fundamentalists, and they reveal that he is opposed to the theological adaptation to social and cultural change. Lord Jesus Christ, help us. He sees a progressive scientific age as a retrogressive spiritual age. Amid change all around, he was is willing to preserve certain ancient ideas, even though they are contrary to our favorite word, science. There's not much more for me to say about this paper and this topic. He feels that he knows so much science and he's so better than everybody else who believes in the Bibles. And he believes that fundamental Christians are people who blindly follow a more or less fairy tale doctrine. In this paper, A Study of Mithraism, Martin Luther King Jr. states that Christianity grew out of the mystery religions. Again, I am not going to dive too deep into this topic because that is for a video for its own. But I hope you ask yourself this question as you read this text. How can one call himself a Christian and deny the fundamental beliefs that is required to be a Christian? Let's dive into this excerpt. It is not at all surprising in the view of of the wide and growing influence of these religions that when the disciples in Antioch and elsewhere preach a crucified and risen Jesus, they should be regarded as the heralds of another mystery religion and that Jesus himself should be taken for the divine Lord of the cults through whose death and resurrection salvation was to be had. It is at this point that we are able to see why knowledge of these cults it is very important for any serious New Testament studies. And I'll stop right here for a minute. I agree. There will be a time when Christians will encounter people who know about the mystery of religions and will try to disprove the Bible with it. So it is very important for Christians to study and know the truth so they can know what to say in the response. It is well nigh impossible to grasp Christianity through and through without knowledge of these cults, that there were striking similarities between the developing church and these religions cannot be denied. Even Christian apologists had to admit that fact. For an instance, in the mystery of religions, identification between the devotee and the lord of the cult was supposed to be brought about by the various rites of initiation. The terabilum, or bath of blood, the eating of flesh, of the sacrificial beast and the like. Pay attention to this part. Now there was something of this in Paul too, for he thought of the believer as buried with Christ in baptism and as feeding upon him in the Eucharist. This is only one of many examples that I could give to prove the similarities between the developing Christian church and the mystery religions. This is not to say that a St. Paul or a St. John sat down and copied these views verbatim. But after being in contact with these surrounding religions and hearing certain doctrines expressed, it was only natural for some of these views to become a part of their subconscious minds. When they sat down to write, they were expressing consciously that which had dwelled in their subconscious minds. It is also significant to know that Roman tolerance had favored this great syncretism of religious ideas, borrowing 
was not only natural, but inevitable. One of the most interesting of these ancient cults was Mithraism, which bore so many points of resemblance to Christianity that it is a challenge to the modern student to investigate these likenesses and learn more about them. I hope you see how Martin Luther King Jr. also lies about the Apostle Paul. Nowhere uh, in the Bible can he even prove that uh, you are actually eating Christ. That's uh, cannibalism or, you know, some sacred cannibalism uh, ritual that many pagan mystery religions do. The man with a PhD cannot even quote scripture, and I do believe that it may be because he knows he's a liar. Nowhere do we find the scripture that when doing the Eucharist, we are softly eating the flesh of Christ as if we are proverbial cannibals. Maybe in a certain denomination, <clears throat> Catholicism, but fundamental Bible believers uh, know that this ain't his flesh. It is almost as if this man doesn't read the Bible nor has a clear understanding of fundamental biblical Christianity. And I ask you one more time, if a man claims to be a Christian, but denies the fundamental basis to become a follower of Christ and refuses to follow the word of God, calling it a myth, a book of fairy tales, then is he truly a Christian? Or is he an actor, an agent of chaos, a child of a disobedience. The last item we are going to dissect is one of his speeches or sermons. This will not be the infamous I have a dream speech, but we will dissect his very last speech before he was bodied. Uh, the speech is called I've Been to the Mountaintop. We will be reading this speech. Also, due to him being a very talented orator, please remember this. That a great orator can sell ice cubes to an Eskimo. Do not be moved by the way his speaking makes you feel, making you not paying attention to the words that he's saying. Also, the reason I'm choosing this speech is because I Have a Dream is one of the most overrated and overused speech. I don't care what you think. Put it in the bank. But secondly, many of his sermons or speeches fail, not all, but many, fail to talk about the good news of Christ, which should not come as a surprise since he denies the divinity of Christ and the Bible overall. However, it would not be fair, it would actually be fair to see if in his last speech we see some changes in his views and accepted the biblical truth. Also keep this scripture in mind as we read and listen to his speech. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verses 4 through 5. So as he gives his speech, I'm going to give forth my commentary. Uh, thank you very kindly, my friends. As I listen to Ralph Abernathy and his eloquent and generous introduction, and uh, then thought about myself, I wondered who he was talking about. <laughs> it's always good to have your closest friend and associate to say something good about you. And Ralph Abernathy is the best friend that I have in the world. I'm delighted to see each of you here tonight in spite of a storm warning. You reveal that you are determined to go on anyhow. 
Something is happening in Memphis, something is happening in our world. And you know, if I was standing at the beginning of time with the possibility of taking a kind of general and panoramic view of the whole of human history up to now, And the Almighty said to me, Martin Luther King, which age would you like to live in? I would take my mental flight by Egypt. And I would watch God's children in their magnificent trek from the dark dungeons of Egypt through or rather across the Red Sea through the wilderness on toward the promised land and in spite of its magnificence I wouldn't stop there I want you to all to pay attention and take heed to the repetition pattern of I wouldn't stop there I would move on by Greece and take my mind to Mount Olympus. And I would see Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Euripides, and Aristophanes assemble around the Parthenon. And I would watch them around the Parthenon as they discuss the great and eternal issues of reality, but I wouldn't stop there. I hope you understand and know that the Parthenon was a Greek temple to the goddess Athena, but, but let's carry on. I would go on even to the great heyday of the Roman Empire. And I would see developments around there through various emperors and leaders, but I wouldn't stop there. Well, the, uh, the Apostle Paul was in Rome. Why not see the spreading of the gospel in Christianity as he claims to be? Wouldn't that be a moment in time to see? I would even come up to the day of the Renaissance and get a quick picture of all that the Renaissance did for the cultural and aesthetic life of man, but I wouldn't stop there. I would even go by the way that the man for whom I'm named had his habitat. And I would watch Martin Luther as he tacked his 95 theses on the door at the church of Wittenberg, but I wouldn't stop there. I would come on up even to 1863 and watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come to the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, but I wouldn't stop there. You know, it's actually interesting, even more interesting, that he does not even state that he would want to see Jesus Christ, see him preach, see him give the Sermon on the Mount, see Jesus do all the miracles, see Jesus get beaten and die on that old rugged cross, and see Jesus resurrected from the dead into the right seat of the Father. Don't you find that interesting at all? Not once does he mention that he wants to see Jesus. I would even come up to the early 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come with an eloquent cry that we have nothing to fear but fear itself but i wouldn't stop there strangely enough i would turn to the almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half 
of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now, that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick. Trouble is in the land, confusion all around. That's a strange statement. But I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up, and wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same, we want to be free. First, God is always working, and it is proof uh, throughout history. That's why in the good book it says there is no new thing under the sun. Secondly, free from what? Free from what, Negro? And another reason that I'm happy to live in this period is that we have been forced to a point where we are going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through history, but the demands didn't force them to do it. Survival demands that we grapple with them. Men for years now have been talking about war and peace, but now no longer can they just talk about it. It is no longer the choice between violence and nonviolence in this world. It's nonviolence or non-existence. That is where we are today. Yeah, see, you know, a lot of uh, smooth-sounding words, but really it means nothing because there's still wars. There are still riots that go on to this day in America. Again, the Bible prophecies that in the last days there will be wars and rumors of wars, so no matter what his liberal doctrine tries to make sound deep in reality, there is still an obvious choice between violence and nonviolence because we're in a fallen world. The true question he needs to be asking to the people and himself is choosing whom ye shall worship, the one and true living God through Jesus Christ, or are you going to keep serving the world and worship the worldly things? And also in the human rights revolution. If something isn't done and done in a hurry to bring the colored peoples of the world out of their long years of poverty, their long years of hurt and neglect, the whole world is doomed. Now, I'm just happy that God has allowed me to live in this period to see what is unfolding. And I'm happy that he's allowed me to be in Memphis. Live poverty? See, doesn't this sound very similar to that prosperity gospel? Those, uh, we call it the charismatic churches be uh, preaching? Where these churches teach that God doesn't want you to be poor, and being poor is pretty much a sin to a certain extent. And again, I guess this man's prophecy has failed because many black folks today ain't really doing too good. Broken families, highest incarceration rates, highest homicide rates, and all they can do is protest and blame the white man. I can remember...
I can remember when Negroes were just going around, as Ralph has said so often, scratching where they didn't itch and laughing when they were not tickled. But that day is all over. We mean business now, and we are determined to gain our rightful place in God's world. And that's all this whole thing is about. We aren't engaged in any negative protest and in any negative arguments with anybody. We are saying that we are determined to be men. We are determined to be people. We are saying... We are saying that we are God's children. And if we are God's children, we don't have to live like we are forced to live. Well, Christ tells us in John 15, verse 19, that God's kingdom is not of this world, and this world loves their own. If ye were of the world, the world will love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hated you. But again, you have to believe that Christ is God, died and resurrected for our sins, and then you become a child of God. And so far, with the information presented, and according to the Bible, Michael King II is not a child of God. He's just preaching to heaven in this wicked world right now, which is unbiblical. Now, what does all of this mean in this great period of history? It means that we've got to stay together. We've got to stay together and maintain unity. You know, whenever Pharaoh wanted to prolong the period of slavery in Egypt, he had a favorite, favorite formula for doing it. What was that? He kept the slaves fighting among themselves. But whenever the slaves get together, something happens in Pharaoh's court, and he cannot hold the slaves in slavery. When the slaves get together, that's the beginning of getting out of slavery. Now let us maintain unity. First, slavery ended over 100 years ago when he made this speech. So what the heck is he talking about? Black people are still slaves. Sure, segregation was bad. Ain't nobody saying that. But before the so-called civil rights movement, the black family was together. It was strong. Black businesses were taking their strides and education was rising too until Marx's uh, indoctrinations infiltrated. Second, where in the Bible does it say Pharaoh made the Hebrews fight amongst themselves? See, I can show you that God controlled Pharaoh's heart to show the Hebrews that he was the most high. Exodus uh, chapter 7 all the way through, uh, I believe, the 14th chapter. Instances where God tells us in his word that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Nothing about Pharaoh causing division. This ain't no Willie Lynch letter, homie. So here we see Martin Luther King believing he is king enough to add to scriptures. Though the Bible tells us not to add to scripture or take away from scripture or he shall be accursed. Secondly, let us keep the issues where they are. The issue is injustice. The issue is the refusal of Memphis to be fair and honest in its dealings with its public servants who happen to be sanitation workers. Now we've got to keep attention on that. 
That's always the problem with a little violence. You know what happened the other day, and the press dealt only with the window breaking. I read the articles. They very seldom got around to mentioning the fact that 1,300 sanitation workers are on strike and that Memphis is not being fair to them and that Mayor Loeb is in dire need of a doctor. They didn't get around to that. Now we're going to march again, and we've got to march again in order to put the issue where it is supposed to be. And force everybody to see that there are 1,300 of God's children here suffering sometimes going hungry, going through dark and dreary nights, wondering how this thing is going to come out. That's the issue. And we've got to say to the nation, we know how it's coming out. For when people get caught up with that which is right and they are willing to sacrifice for it, there is no stopping point short of victory. This is the Black Liberation Theology in a nutshell. We don't have to believe in Christ and spirit and the truth. We just got to claim the name of Christ. Because us black folks are like the Hebrews coming out of slavery in Egypt, even though American slavery ended in the mid-1800s. We are still like them. And in many ways, they are like Israel. I'll, I'll say that for a fact. They are like Israel. But not in the sense of Israel being freed from Pharaoh and Egypt, but in the sense of constantly turning their backs to the Most High. And I'll say this. The so-called black community is not going to progress in the right path unless they repent and believe in Christ and spirit and in truth and turn back uh, their faces to the most high, like our ancestors once did. We aren't going to let any may stop us. We are masters in our nonviolent movement in disarming police forces. They don't know what to do. I've seen them so often. I remember in Birmingham, Alabama, when we were in that Majestic struggle there. We would move out of the 16th Street Baptist Church day after day. By the hundreds, we would move out, and Bull Connor would tell them to send the dogs for us. And they did come. But we just went before the dogs singing, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Bull Connor next would say, turn the fire hoses on. And as I said to you the other night, Bull Connor didn't know history. He knew a kind of physics that somehow didn't relate to the trans physics that we knew about. And that was the fact that there was a certain kind of fire that no water could put out. We went before the fire hose. We had known water. If we were Baptist or some other denomination, we had been immersed. If we were Methodist and some others, we had been sprinkled. But we knew water. That couldn't stop us. You know, here's the problem, as well as my problem with the idea of protesting in general. If there's a community that does, that does not want me, then I won't go over there. I'll stay and make my community better. But if I do go over there where I'm not welcome or belong to, then I'm just asking for trouble and agitating. I know that may sound unorthodox, it sounds rough, but that is what this whole movement was really about, 
and you see the fruits of it with Black Lives Matter and all these other activists, so-called activist uh, organizations. All they love to do is agitate and cause chaos and more chaos and then go to the media and then cry victim. And we just went on before the dogs and we would look at them and we'd go on before the water hoses and we would look at it and we'd just go on singing over my head, I see freedom in there. And then we would be thrown into paddy wagons and sometimes we were stacked in there like sardines in a can. And they would throw us in and old bull would say, take them off. And they did and we would just go on in the paddy wagon singing, we shall overcome. And every now and then we'd get in jail and we'd see the jailers looking through the windows, being moved by our prayer and being moved by our words and our songs. There was a power there which Bull Connor couldn't adjust, adjust to. And so we ended up transforming Bull into a steer, and we won our struggle in Birmingham. <laughs> now we've got to go on in Memphis just like that. I call upon you to be with us when we go out Monday. Now about injunctions, we have an injunction and we're going into court tomorrow morning to fight this illegal, unconstitutional injunction. All we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country. Maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. So just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. We are going on. We need all of you. And you know what's beautiful to me? is to see all of these ministers of the gospel. It's a marvelous picture. Who is it that is supposed to articulate the longings and aspirations of the people more than the preacher? Somehow the preacher must have a kind of fire shut up in his bones. And whenever injustice is around, he must tell it. Somehow the preacher must be an Amos said, when God speaks, who can but prophesy? Again with Amos, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Somehow the preacher must say with Jesus, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And he's anointed me to deal with the problems of the poor. Well, brother, uh, the spirit of the Lord is not with you unless this is your testimony because it is the preacher's job to preach and teach the gospel. He is using scripture to justify his unbiblical social justice gospel. Also, when he was reading off the Bill of Rights, it made me think about uh, this being 
why many so-called Republicans and conservative Christians get to argue with me because I point out that too often the Constitution and American patriotism becomes doctrine and gospel instead of the true word of God. And that they need to separate from this world more before they get caught up, uh, caught up into it unknowingly or knowingly. And I want to commend the preachers under the leadership of these noble men, James Lawson, one who has been in this struggle for many years. He's been to jail for struggling. He's been kicked out of Vanderbilt University for this struggling, but he's still going on fighting for the rights of his people. Yeah. Reverend Ralph Jackson, Billy Kyle, I could just go right on down the list. It's time will not permit, but I want to thank all of them. And I want you to thank them. Because so often, preachers aren't concerned about anything but themselves. And I'm always happy to see a relevant ministry. It's all right to talk about long white robes over yonder in all of its symbolism. But ultimately, people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey, but God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and his children who can't eat three square meals a day. It's all right to talk about the new Jerusalem, but one day God's preacher must talk about the new New York the new Atlanta, the new Philadelphia, the new Los Angeles, the new Memphis, Tennessee. This is what we have to do. Now, the other thing we'll have to do is this. Nah, homie, God has talked, uh, commanded you to talk about the kingdom to come and what to do to make your land into a land of milk and honey. For we all sin, whether white, black, or whatever, and fall short of the glory of God. If this Negro studied the word of God, he would see how God blesses a nation and would see what to do according to the Bible. And don't get me wrong, I want to live in a moral society. However, human beings are fallen and far from perfect. But again, in this case, he is using the Bible like the head hoe for his uh, social justice pimp scheme. I guarantee many of those who listen to Michael King weren't saved. And if you're listening to this man and are enticed with the words that this man always speaks, have you ever heard once through this speech thus far where he talks about how to be saved in the Christian life? Nah, he's tossing the word of God to the, he's tossing the word of God to the side and wants a new heaven on earth without uh, mentioning the gospel or mentioning the Christ of the Bible. And whatever Christ he's talking about is not the Christ of the Bible. Obviously, it's that other Christ, another Jesus, that Antichrist. Always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal. Now, we are poor people. Individually, we are poor when you compare us with white society in America. We are poor. Never stop and forget that collectively, that means all of us together, collectively, we are richer than all the nations in the world with the exception of nine. Did you ever think about that? After you leave the United States, Soviet Russia, Great Britain, West Germany, France, and I can name others, the 
American Negro collectively is richer than most nations of the world. We have an annual income of more than $30 billion a year, which is more than all of the exports of the United States and more than the national budget of Canada. Did you know that? That's power right there if we know how to pool it. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What purpose is it for a so-called Christian preacher to preach about white America versus black America and the money power? For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. We don't have to argue with anybody. We don't have to curse and go around acting bad with our words. We don't need any bricks and bottles. We don't need any Molotov cocktails. We just need to go around to these stores and to these massive industries in our country and say, God sent us by here to say to you that you're not treating his children right. And we come by here to ask you to make the first item on your agenda fair treatment where God's children are concerned. Now, if you are not prepared to do that, we do have an agenda that we must follow. And our agenda calls for withdrawing economic support from you. So as a result of this, we're asking you tonight to go out and tell your neighbors not to buy Coca-Cola in Memphis. Go by and tell them not to buy sealed test milk. Tell them not to buy what is all the bread, Wonder Bread. And what is other bread come to Jesse? Tell them not to buy hearts bread. As Jesse Jackson has said up to now, only the garbage men have been feeling pain. Now we must kind of redistribute the pain. We are choosing these companies because they have been fair in their hiring policies. And we are choosing them because they can begin the process of saying they are going to support the needs and the rights of these men who are on strike. And then they can move on town, downtown and tell Mayor Loeb to do what is right. And not only that, we've got to strengthen black institutions. I call upon you to take your money out of the banks downtown and deposit your money in Tri-State Bank. We want a bank-in movement in Memphis. Go buy the Savings and Loan Association. I'm not asking you something that we don't do ourselves in SCLC. Judge Hooks and others will tell you that we have an account here in the Savings and Loan Association from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. We are telling you to follow what we are doing. Put your money there. You have six or seven black insurance companies here in the city of Memphis. Take out your insurance there. We want to have an insurance in. Now, these are some practical things that we can do. 
we begin the process of building a great economic base. And at the same time, we are putting pressure where it really hurts. And I ask you to follow through here. Now let me say as I move to my conclusion that we've got to give ourselves to this struggle until the end. Nothing would be more tragic than to stop at this point in Memphis. We've got to see it through. When we have our march, you need to be there. If it means leaving work, if it means leaving school, be there. Be concerned about your brother. You may not be on strike, but either we go up together or we go down together. Let us develop a kind of dangerous unselfishness. Don't you find it odd that a preacher is encouraging people not to work as well as to develop a dangerous unselfishness and not a biblical one? Interesting. One day a man came to Jesus and he wanted to raise some questions about some vital matters of life. At points, he wanted to trick Jesus and show him that he knew a little more than Jesus knew and throw him off base. Now that question could have easily ended up in a philosophical and theological debate. But Jesus immediately pulled that question from midair and placed it on a dangerous curve between Jerusalem and Jericho. And he talked about a certain man who fell among thieves. And you remember that a Levite and the priest passed by on the other side. They didn't stop to help him. And finally, a man of another race came by. He got down from his beast, decided not to be compassionate by proxy, but he got down with him, administered first aid, and helped the man in need. Jesus ended up saying this was the good man, this was the great man, because he had the capacity to project the eye into the thou and to be concerned about his brother. Now, you know, we use our imagination a great deal to try to determine why the priest and the Levite didn't stop. The times we say they were busy going to a church meeting, an ecclesiastical gathering, and they had to get on down to Jerusalem so they wouldn't be late for their meeting. At other times, we would speculate that there was a religious law that one who was engaged in religious ceremonial was not to touch a human body 24 hours before the ceremony. And every now and then we began to wonder whether maybe they were not going down to Jerusalem, or down to Jericho rather, to organize a Jericho Road Improvement Association. That's a possibility. Maybe they felt that it was better to deal with the problem from the causal root rather than to get bogged down with an individual effect. But I'm going to tell you what my imagination tells me. It's possible that those men were afraid. You see, the Jericho Road is a dangerous road. I remember when Mrs. King and I were first in Jerusalem. We rented a car and drove from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And as soon as we got on that road, I said to my wife, I can see why Jesus used this 
as the setting for his parable. It's a winding, meandering road. It's really conducive for ambushing. You start out in Jerusalem, which is about 1,200 miles, or rather 1,200 feet above sea level. And by the time you get down to Jericho, 15 or 20 minutes later, you are about 2,200 feet below sea level. That's a dangerous road. In the days of Jesus, it came to be known as the bloody paths. And you know it's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over that man on the ground and wondered if the robbers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely faking. And he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to seize them over there, love them there for quick and easy seizure. And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to my job? Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That's the question. Well, again, as a pastor, are you helping them in their Christian walk or are you helping them be professional agitators, which is the proper stance for a pastor? Is it helping the worker live a good Christian life in the midst of a fallen world? Or is it finding ways to get workers' excuses not to work and have people feel sorry for them and treat them like little victims? Christ, who lived amongst the poor, did not walk around saying, Woe is me, a poor man, I'm so oppressed. He did his father's work, and that is what we all should do, which is to live on the straight and narrow path, believe and follow Christ and his commandments to guide you in this wicked world that will never be perfect until our Savior returns. Because the truth is that life moves on whether you like it or not. People will hate you, whether, and it ain't no boycotting or protesting, going to do a darn thing about it. A darn thing about it. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination and let us move on. In these powerful days, these days of challenge to make America what it ought to be, we have an opportunity to make America a better nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, Are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing, and I said, yes. The next minute, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. And that blade had gone through, and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, 
You drowned in your own blood. That's the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, to move around in the wheelchair in the hospital. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in, and from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and the vice president. I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I'd received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter that came from a little girl, a young girl, who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it said simply, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. She said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering, and I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962. The Negroes in all Bennett, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963. The black people of Birmingham, Alabama, aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama, to see the great movement there if I had sneezed. I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me. Now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning, and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we are sorry for the delay. But we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked, and to be sure that nothing would be wrong on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got into Memphis. 
And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. Yeah. Uh, what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers? I hope y'all peep the uh, vain repetition uh, Martin Luther King was uh, doing with the uh, If I Had Sneezed. And since I'm thinking about it, um, I believe in Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, verse 12. Um, they are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. You see that he is given all the glory to himself and none to the most high. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 23. But nothing of the good news of Christ, sin, and salvation. None at all about God is all about Michael King II glorifying himself as God, sitting in the temple of God in his powerful oratory ways. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which hath power over these plagues, and and they repented not to give him glory. Revelation chapter 16, verse 9. And so far clearly, we see this in Dr., so-called Dr. King. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. The mountaintop of what? Again, this this makes no sense. What mountaintop? Not on mine. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. God's will, huh? Okay, denying Christ is God's will. Saying the word of God is a book of myths is God's will. Preaching the money and being poor is a sin gospel is God's will. Being a preacher that is constantly glorifying himself is God's will. What promised land is he talking about? Or is he just trying to sound deep like he always does? What mountaintop has he been allowed to see that anyone else hasn't been allowed to see? Perhaps is he glorifying himself to a status of Moses, just like how Moses was allowed to see the promised land before God took him away? Or is he glorifying himself to a black Messiah figure? What about the longing for eternal life in the kingdom of God once Christ returns? Is that not God's will for those he considered his own children? I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Yeah, his eyes seen something, all right? This man will be judged. So far, we have seen that he has not repented, even though this is his last speech. This man is a false prophet, according to the word of God. After looking at this sermon, which is nothing more but a speech, we see that Michael King's Jr.'s views has not changed since his college years. He still does not preach the gospel unless it is to justify his liberal ideas, which means he's twisting uh, uh, the gospel to fit his own personal beliefs. He preaches the black liberation and social justice gospel. He doesn't preach repentance, and it seems that he still views Christianity as just another philosophy off the bookshelf of quote-unquote scholars and experts. I hope what I presented to y'all shows that this man was a denier of Christ and used the name of Christ to push his stupid movements and most likely, and I'm sure of, to put money in his own pockets behind the scenes.
in Michael Hoffman's Holiday for a Cheater, the first public sermon that King ever gave in 1947 at the Ebenezer Baptist Church was plagiarized by Protestant clergyman Harry Emerson Fosdick entitled Life is What You Make It, according to the testimony of one of King's best friends at that time, Reverend Larry H. Williams. The first book that King wrote, Stride Towards Freedom, was also plagiarized from numerous sources, all unattributed according to documentation recently assembled by sympathetic King scholars, King D. Miller, Ira G. Zepp Jr., and David J. Garrell, and no less an authoritative source than the four senior editors of the papers of Martin Luther King Jr., an official publication of the Martin Luther King Center for Nonviolent Social Change, Incorporated, whose staff includes King's widow, Peretta. Stated of King's writing at both Boston University and Crozer Theological Seminary, and I quote, Judge retroactively by the standards of academic scholarship. His writings are tragically flawed by numerous instances of plagiarism. Appropriated passages are particularly evident in his writings in his major field of graduate study, systematic theology. King's essay, The Place of Reason and Experience in Finding God, written at Crozer, pirated passages from the work of theologian Edgar S. Brightman, author of The Finding of God. Another of King's thesis, a contemporary of continental theology, written shortly after he entered Boston University, was largely stolen from a book by Walter Marshall Horton. King's doctoral dissertation, a comparison of the conceptions of God in the thinking of Paul Til- Tilchett and Harry Nelson Wy- Wyman, for which he was awarded a Ph.D. in theology, contains more than 50 completed sentences plagiarized from the Ph.D. dissertation of Dr. Jack Boozer, the place of reason in Paul Tillich's uh, concept of God. According to Martin Luther King's papers, in King's dissertation, only 49% of sentences in the section of Tillich contains five or more words that were King's own. In the Journal of American History, June 1991, page 87, David J. Garrow, a leftist academic who is sympathetic to King, says that King's wife, Coretta Scott King, who also served as his secretary, was an accomplice in his repeated cheating. Reading Garrow's article, one is led to the doomed conclusion that King cheated because he had chosen for himself a political role in which a Ph.D. would be useful and, lacking the intellectual ability to obtain the title fairly, went after it by any means necessary. Huh, maybe that's why Malcolm X and him got uh, along at the end of Malcolm X's life. Just kidding for all those who uh, are boy fans of Malcolm X. Why then, one might ask, did the professors at Crozer Theological Seminary and Boston University grant him passing grades and a PhD, even though many knew about his plagiarism? Garrow states on page 89, King's academic compositions, especially at Boston University, were almost without exception little more than summary descriptions in comparison of other writings. Nonetheless, the papers almost always received a desirable letter grade, strongly suggesting that King's professor did not expect more. Dang. The editors of the Martin Luther King Jr.'s paper states that, the failure of King's teachers to notice the pattern, his pattern of textual appropriation is somewhat remarkable. This also shows the integrity of these schools that trickle down to the school systems today. But researchers, uh, Michael Hoffman tells us, actually, the malfeasance of the professor is not at all remarkable. King was politically correct. He was black, and he had ambitions. The leftist professors were happy to award a doctorate to such a candidate no matter how much fraud was involved. Nor is it any wonder that it has taken 40 years for the truth about King's record of nearly constant intellectual piracy to be made public. Suppose scholars who in reality share King's vision of a racial 
racially mixed and Marxist America purposely covered up for his cheating for decades. The cover-up still continues, however. From the New York Times of October 11, 1991, page 15, we learned that on October 10th of that year, a committee of researchers at Boston University admitted that, and I quote, there is no question but that Dr. King plagiarized in the dissertation. However, despite its findings, the committee said that, quote unquote, no, no thought should be given to the revocation of Dr. King's doctoral degree. An action, the panel said, would serve no purpose. That's very unfortunate because it does serve a purpose. For a man that stated he wants to live where he is not judged by the color of his skin, but by the contents of his character, he sure shows some bad character by stealing from other people's papers in order to get a high title for himself. At a seminary school, for the love of Christ allowed him to get away with stealing? Exodus chapter 22 verse 1. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five ox for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. Biblical justice demands that. In light of his willful fraud as a student, the reverend and the doctor should be and needs to be removed from King's name. The last concerning thing that one should observe is how Martin Luther King uh, handled his money. I must not go too deep into things that he used uh, money for because I will reveal that more in um, part two and part three, uh, maybe part three of this presentation. However, I will talk about what happened to his money after his death. Quote, there's nothing in all the world greater than freedom. It is worth paying for. It is worth losing a job for. It is worth going to jail for. I would rather be a free pauper than a rich slave. I would rather die in abject poverty with my convictions than live in inordinate riches with the lack of self-respect. This is a statement that Michael King II made. Of course, Christ is not better than worldly freedom, but I, I digress. Michael King II died not only without financial assets, but... Without a will. Despite his widely known premonitions concerning his own early demise, King died interstate. Although his wife Coretta had admonished him for years to set some uh, funds aside for the higher education of their four children, four children, King left his family with no appreciable benefits from his five books, hundreds of speaking engagements, his ministry, and most concern to his wife, the $54,600, which is $416,000 in modern day, he earned as a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. While Mrs. King thought some of the award money should be invested for the children's sake, instead her husband, the father of her kids, donated the funds to the movement. The movement was more important than his own family. This is the equivalent to some of these nonprofit organizations and uh, political groups that are the talented speakers of the Negroes, uh, getting money to help the hood or black communities, and somehow the average so-called black American does not see a penny of that money. Another indictment is that he was a so-called Christian preacher that chose not to give his family an inheritance. According to the Bible, a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Proverbs 13, verse 22. Not giving his family a dime is not the Christian way. This is another reason to activate uneasiness to the man that is viewed worldwide as a visionary Christian, a moral crusader, for he did something that was contradictory to what he is viewed as. He wanted to be judged by the content of his character, and lo and behold, he denies Christ. He used the name of Christ for filthy lucre. He was a plagiarist, and he also left no will, no inheritance for his own family. What man can be called righteous and upright if he did much wickedness until the very end of his life? 
For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works.